Okay, today's lesson is lesson five, War Begins. We arrived today at the tipping point. The careful balance that had been maintained between the British and their American colonies was falling apart. Let's explore the days leading up to the first battle of the Revolution. Keep in mind the two very different perspective each side brings to their movement moment in history. Each thought they were all right. Not only did the colonists and the British have different ideas about who was right and wrong, but there were many different opinions among the colonists themselves on how all of this growing conflict should be handled. The First Continental Congress and the First Battles of the Revolution were important steps in unifying the leaders and the people of the colonies. The First Continental Congress. Do you remember the intolerable acts following the Tea Party, Boston Tea Party? When the British enacted them, their goal was to punish Bostonians for their rebellious behavior, but ironically, the acts served to unify the colonies. In response to the harsh treatment from England, 56 representatives from all of the colonies except Georgia, they, they didn't join until the following year, decided it was time to hold a formal meeting to talk about how they should react. They gathered in Philadelphia in late 1774 and began to debate an argument. More conservative colonies wanted to call, uh, boycott British goods unless the Intolerable Act was repealed, while more progressive members felt they needed to stand up for their rights and declare independence. There was so much debating going on that John Adams, a Massachusetts representative to the Congress, gave the illustration that even two plus three equal five would have been debated had it been voiced. After a month or so of discussion, the members of the Congress managed to agree that a boycott was an appropriate response to the intolerable acts. The colonists' rights as British citizens were being violated by taxation without representation. The Congress also asked the colonies to train their own militia in preparing for defense against England. Although opinions were many, the unity that resulted from the Continental Congress was expressed eloquently in Representative Patrick Henry's words. The distinctions between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, and New Englanders are no more. I am not a Virginia, but an American. Although the colonies were not yet ready to agree on independence, they were ready to stand up to the British, and that's exactly what happened next. Convictions. Are you the type of person who tries something new without hesitation? Are you a little more cautious, wanting to see how things turn out for others before jumping in? God created each of us differently, with unique temperaments and opinions. This in combination with the kind of situations and people we have grown up with, form our convictions. Are our, our, our convictions ever wrong? Absolutely. If we didn't make mistakes, we would all agree all the time, and we know that's not how the world works. Constantly comparing our convictions to the example of Jesus is the key to staying on track and forming beliefs in which we can be confident. It makes sense, then, that the colonists had a similar diversity of opinions. Let's take a moment to explore how the very different perspective, how the very different perspectives of these groups shaped the climate of the colonies. The Loyalist. The Loyalists got their name from their loyalty to British Crown, King George and the British government, and were also called Tories, conservatives. They opposed independence and believed that the colonies were strongest when unified with the British. Taxing the colonies seemed totally reasonable to them. After all, much of the debt was from their defense. Patriots. The Patriots were the fiery progressive group that believed they must stand up to Parliament as their rights were taken away. Taxation without representation was the biggest complaint, and they felt their independence was the only option. They were able to win over more undecided fence-sitters than the lobbyist loyalists were. This was important because they needed the support of the people to be successful in their bid for independence. Fence-sitter. 
If you sit astride a fence, you usually put one leg on one side, and this is exactly what the political fence sitters did. They sat in a safe spot, not ready to make a decision as to who they supported. Choosing a side meant taking a big risk. No one knew how all the world turned out. Not surprisingly, fence sitters were the largest group of colonists by far. The story of Benjamin and William Franklin illustrates how deeply divided the loyalists and patriots were. Political views split up communities, friendships, and even families. As we learned yesterday, Benjamin Franklin used his influence to win an appointment of Ventura governor for his son, William. Benjamin later became a devoted patriot, but William remained a loyalist throughout his life. When William was jailed after the revolution, Benjamin did nothing to intervene. The conflict between them grew over the years, and sadly, they were never able to reconcile. Benjamin's words describing the situation remind us of the importance of relationship. Nothing has ever hurt me as much as to find myself deserted in my old age by my only son and not only deserted, but to find him taking up arms against me in a cause wherein my good fame, fortune, and life were all at stake. Battle of Lexington and Concord, April 19, 1775. The pressure cooker of the American colonies had reached a critical point. The boycott on British goods never did bring about a repeal of the intolerable act as hoped. In April of 1775, the British governor of Massachusetts, General Gage, got word of a stash of weapons being stored by the Patriot Militia in Concord, about 20 miles from Boston. He decided to march troops out to confiscate them. Some said he almost planned to arrest John Hancock and Samuel Adams, two members of the Continental Congress, who were staying at a house on the road to Concord. Of course, he wanted to keep this top secret. The success of this plan depended on a sneak attack. In order to prevent any patriots from warning either of his targets, he stationed soldiers on the Boston Neck, the small piece of land connecting Boston to the mainland of Massachusetts, and a ship on the Charles River. These were the two ways of leaving town, and he didn't want anyone getting out of Boston that night. Did you know... You may have heard of Paul Revere's ride, but did you know he wasn't the only one riding that night? William Dawes and Samuel Prescott also played a role, though Revere is the famous one who gets all the credit. Revere and Dawes snuck out of Boston and took different routes to Lexington. Prescott joined them near Lexington on their way to Concord, and it was a good thing for the militia they did. Revere and Dawes were detained by British soldiers, but Samuel Prescott made it to the Concord to warn the patriots of the British approach. So why do we hear so much about Paul Revere and so little about the other two writers? It may have been because he was a well-known son of liberty, as well as the fact that he completed another important job before leaving Boston. He had worked out a plan with the signal lanterns placed in the tower of the Old North Church to let the patriots across the river in Charleston know how the British were coming. Two lit candles lanterns would mean the British were coming by sea across the Charles River, and one lit lantern would mean the British were coming by land if they were marching out across Boston Neck. This was a backup plan in case Revere was captured before getting out of Boston. An activity break would be Henry Wadswood Longfellow's famous poem, Paul Revere's Ride, is a powerful verse describing the events on the eve of the American Revolution. Find the text on the resource page and read that. The shot heard round the world. Let's get back to roughly 700 British soldiers marching across, marching across towards Concord near daybreak. Their plan was actually to pass through Lexington and get to Concord to gain control of the bridges in and out of town. You can imagine how surprised they were to meet a group of 77 armed Minutemen in Lexington. What happened next is unclear. Commanders on both sides reported telling their men to hold their fire, but a single shot ran out nonetheless, now referred to as the shot heard around the world. It was the beginning of the seven years of war between Britain and her colonies. A short battle followed, but the British easily triumphed and headed on towards Concord. Eight patriots were killed and one British soldier injured. 
As the Brit- British arrived in Concord, 250 patriots marched out to meet them. The British attempted to find the weapons they were after, but because of Samuel Prescott's warning, the Patriots were expecting them, and most of the weapons had already been hidden. At the North Bridge, the British Army was again confronted, this time by 400 Patriots. As the British retreated, they were ambushed by American militiamen hiding in the hills above. The attack continued all day as the British tried to return to Boston. When darkness fell and the fighting stopped, 273 British soldiers were dead, as well as 95 Patriots. At the end of the day, neither side felt the battles were their fault. The British believed they had been ambushed while keeping the countryside safe, while the Patriots felt they had been attacked while defending their property. The perspectives of the two sides were farther apart than ever. However, the meeting of the Continental Congress and the first battles of the American Revolution united the Patriots. By the end of the month, several thousand more Minutemen joined up to fight the British. This strong sense of common purpose would be the driving force force behind the revolutionaries' struggle for freedom and ultimately independence in the years to come. And let's talk about it. It's important to understand the perspective of a person or opinion you don't agree with. With a family member or friend, stage a debate about the events in this lesson with one person representing the patriot side and the other representing the loyalist side. You can imagine you are delegates to the First Continental Congress or just citizens of the colony. This, consu- uh, this concludes Lesson 5.